and welcome to our second annual Society Sunday event hosted by the Societies Committee of the Archaeological Institute of America. My name is Sabrina Higgins and I'm the Vice President for Societies for the AIA. Society Sunday was initiated as a standalone event last year in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic as a way for members of the AIA to come together in lieu of a meeting in person um, at the annual meeting, which went virtual for the ver very first time in its storied history last year. Given the success of last year's event, we decided to hold a second virtual Society Sunday this year, and we hope to continue this tradition once the pandemic is over as a way to thank you for your continued membership in our organization. We also want to use this annual event as a way to recruit new members <clears throat> to the AIA who might in turn join our organization and become active members of local AIA chapters. For more information on how to join the AIA, please see the link posted below in the chat function of the Zoom meeting. As the first event of, our, of the day, I have the honor of introducing our featured Society Sunday speaker, Dr. Debbie Sneed. Debbie Sneed is a lecturer in the Department of Classics at California State University, Long Beach. She received her BA from the University of Wyoming, her MA from the University of Colorado, and her PhD from the University of California at Los Angeles. Her research interests are disability, identity, and marginalization in ancient Greece, and the archaeology of ancient Greece. Her article, The Architecture of Access, Ramps at Ancient Greek Healing Sanctuaries, Antiquity uh, 2020, was awarded the 2021 Ben Cullen Prize by the Journal of Antiquity for outstanding work in archaeology. She has an article on disability and infanticide published by um, Hesperia in 2021, and is, uh, which is actually open access and um, we'll post it in the chat for you to all have a look at. Uh, and she's currently working on a monograph entitled Not Another Other, Physical Disability, Ableism, and Disableism in Ancient Greece. You will also note that there is a live American Sign Language interpretation that will accompany this talk. We hope that we can continue providing this kind of service in the future for AIA public lectures in order to make our programming more inclusive. As a final note, we will be taking questions uh, for the last 20 minutes of this hour long or of this hour long session, I should say. Um, and you can put those questions in the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your screen. I would like to now turn this talk over to Dr. Debbie Sneed, who will give her paper entitled Disability, Infanticide, uh, and Infanticide in Ancient Greece. And please note that this lecture is being recorded. Hello, everyone. It's great to see you all here. My talk today is based on an article that I just published in Hesperia, which is the Journal of the American School of Classical Studies at Athens. In honor of this event, this article has been made open access, which means it is freely available to read and download online. I'm going to drop a link to that uh, in the chat. If you have any problems with this, feel free to email me directly. Looking ahead for today's talk, of course, we're talking about something a little sensitive today, infanticide or the deliberate killing of infants after they're born. I'll show a couple of slides toward the end that show human remains. They're not complete articulated skeletons, just a couple of individual bones, but I'll let you know when they're coming so that you can adjust your engagement if you need to. Before we get started, I wanna thank the organizers of this talk, especially Sabrina Higgins and Meredith Langlitz, as well as our team of ASL interpreters from Trailblazing Interpreters, a group that is committed to making outdoor programs more accessible, which is fantastic for our archeological programs. Let's begin by talking about what happened in ancient Greece when a baby was born. In ancient Greece, the birth of a baby is what we might call its biological birth. It's born, but it's not formally a person yet. 
That happens at a formal initiation ceremony called the amphidromia, which was held on the fifth or seventh day after birth. This ceremony is sometimes called the naming ceremony. It was the ceremony that marked an infant's social birth, which was differentiated from its biological birth. So first you're born, and then you're granted a kind of formal personhood at this ceremony. We think at most times this ceremony took place in the home, but in this stele, this relief from the archeological museum at Lamia, you can see a woman holding out her newborn infant toward the goddess Artemis, who is a protector of women during childbirth. If infanticide of any infant were technically legal in ancient Greece, the window of opportunity would have been after the child is born as a biological person, but before they're born as a social person at this ceremony. Now, when we talk about infanticide, we have to be clear that there is an alternative to infanticide called exposure, where you don't kill your infant outright, but you kind of leave them in a public place in hopes that someone else will come along and pick them up and raise them. Sometimes we think of exposure and infanticide as sort of the same thing, but actually they're alternatives. Since exposure was a hope for a child to live, just somewhere else. But infanticide or exposure, we actually don't know very much about the legality of either practice. We don't know how often it really happened and we don't know under what circumstances it may have happened, especially because most of our evidence comes from the realm of myth or tragedy. Maybe the most famous example of infanticide in the ancient Greek world is the figure of Oedipus, whose parents actually wanted him killed but a shepherd instead gave him over to a king and queen of another city, which permitted Oedipus to live and unfortunately to fulfill his fate of killing his father and marrying his mother. But of course, infanticide in this case with Oedipus works as a kind of plot device and we can't make any direct statements about real life based on tragedy or myth. Regardless of how much we don't know about infanticide in ancient Greece, there's a lot of speculation about it. People wonder, for example, whether girls were more likely than boys to be killed. One thing a lot of people seem to agree on is that disabled infants were almost always killed at birth. We hear this a lot about ancient Sparta, for example, but it sometimes also gets generalized to the whole ancient Greek world. For my talk today, I'll start by addressing what evidence gets used to argue that ancient Greeks did kill disabled infants. I'll then present evidence that shows the opposite, that disabled infants were not only not killed, but that parents, midwives, and physicians often provided active care to infants who were sick, weak, or disabled in order to encourage their survival. So probably the most famous passage about the ancient Greek practice of killing disabled infants comes from Plutarch, who is a first or second century CE Roman author. Plutarch wrote a series of biographies about famous Greek and Roman men, including one about a man named Lycurgus, who was kind of a semi-mythical lawgiver of ancient Sparta. According to Plutarch, Lycurgus instituted strict laws for Sparta, including one that required that newborn infants be brought before a council of elders who would decide if each infant should be raised or killed. If this council decided that the infant were firm and strong, the council would order that it be raised. But if the infant were low born and disabled, they ordered it to be killed. And you can see the justification for this law on the slide. It was instituted, quote, on the grounds that it is neither better for themselves nor for the city for the infant to live its natural life poorly equipped in terms of health and strength immediately from the beginning, end quote. Now, this passage shows up a lot in discussions in the, of infanticide in the ancient world, and it gets taught in classes, mostly, I think, for its shock value. But does this hold up as evidence for ancient Greek practice? 
scholars have trusted Plutarch about this law because it fits into our preconceived notions about the Spartans, who we think of as having a society that was so dedicated to a martial ethos that there was no room for anyone who couldn't conform physically to the rigorous training standards that Sparta was famous for. But this just actually doesn't fit in with our ev other evidence about Sparta. For example, in the fourth century BCE, the Spartan king Agesilaus II was probably disabled from birth, but he wasn't killed. And Plutarch suggests that his impairments in no way influenced his character or his ability to lead as a king. And Plutarch himself warns us against taking his comments about Lycurgus literally. At the very beginning of his biography of Lycurgus, he says that it is impossible to say anything about Lycurgus that is undisputed. Plutarch isn't even very straightforward about disability. He talks about disability a lot in his works, and he presents a lot of different views on it. Throughout his works, Plutarch uses disability more metaphorically than any other way. There's this anecdote that Plutarch gives several times about a Spartan soldier who has a mobility impairment. His fellow soldiers mock him for thinking he can line up with the rest of the non-disabled soldiers. But the limping Spartan says that his disability is irrelevant because the Spartan army needs soldiers who hold their ground in battle, not ones who run away. By the way, I really like this anecdote in Plutarch about the disabled Spartan soldier because it shows a kind of awareness of what might be called grip humor that we see echoed later in history. In a bit of maybe unintentional classical reception, there's this guy named Charles Johnson. He was a commander of the so-called Invalid Corps during the US Civil War. Please forgive the language. It's what they were using in the 1860s but even then this was thought to be an inappropriate term. The Invalid Corps was created in 1863 and eventually it included almost 20,000 men across the country. And they would do things like guard military prisons, protect warehouses and railways and enforce the draft. The idea was that by using disabled men in this way, non-disabled soldiers could be used on the front lines. Well, Colonel Charles Johnson and the Invalid Corps were guarding supplies at White House Landing in Virginia. They were attacked by Confederate forces. Worried about the loss of supplies, Johnson's superior officer sent him an urgent message asking, will your invalid stand? And Johnson replied, my men are cripples and they can't run. Just a funny little echo of disabled humor from Plutarch to the Civil War. Now, the important point about all of this with Plutarch is that we can't know if the ancient Spartans of any time mandated the killing of disabled infants. Plutarch lived more than 700 years after Lycurgus supposedly instituted this law. Other earlier authors who talk about Lycurgus's reforms, like Xenophon and Aristotle, they don't mention this law. Finally, this exact same story about a lawgiver who is so harsh that he requires that certain infants be killed at birth is used by other Roman period authors like Diodorus Siculus and Dionysius of Halicarnassus to describe both Romulus, the legendary founder of Rome, and another king from India. This idea of this law seems to belong more to a rhetoric of ancient moral ethnography or history. We can use it to talk about Plutarch's contributions to what we refer to as the Spartan mirage. We can use it to talk about first and second century CE Roman attitudes about disability and infanticide, but we can't use it as evidence to talk about actual ancient Spartan practice. So Plutarch gets used a lot in our thinking about whether ancient Greeks killed disabled infants, but so do the works of two fourth century BCE philosophers, Plato and Aristotle. Plato's Republic is his vision for a utopian society. Plato doesn't describe his current society. He describes the society that he wishes that he could build. In book five of the Republic, two men are talking, Socrates and Glaucon, and they're talking about good breeding practices. 
Socrates asks Glaucon if he breeds all of his hunting dogs alike. And Glaucon admits that he only breeds his best animals together. Socrates says that this is good practice, not just for animals, but also for humans. And so in an ideal state, rulers have to devise means to breed only the best women and the best men and to discourage inferior men and women from reproducing. This character of Socrates goes even further. He says that authorities must be enfranchised to take the offspring of good parents and raise them. And you can see quoted here on the screen, the children of inferior parents, and if some children of other parents are disabled, will be hidden away in a secret and unknown place as is fitting. So in Plato's Republic, the character of Socrates isn't clearly saying that disabled children should be killed, but he does say that the children of inferior parents and any children of who are disabled should be hidden away. He stops short of condemning them to death, but he seems to be saying that lower class children and any children who are disabled should be denied enfranchisement and a social existence. Aristotle's politics is his own vision of a utopian society. In Aristotle's utopia, measures should be taken in order that the bodies of offspring adhere to the wish of the lawgiver. Aristotle lists all sorts of rules for when to conceive, when pregnant women should eat, and so on. And he prescribes, you can see this on the screen, concerning the exposure or raising of offspring. Let there be a law not to raise a disabled infant. Now, Aristotle is pretty clear here. He thinks that disabled infants should not be raised. But again, this is a utopian text. And we know that Aristotle is not consistently eugenicist in his other texts. Elsewhere, Aristotle says that sometimes disabled infants are born from disabled parents, but that sometimes children born of disabled parents are themselves not disabled. And he says that there's no special rule about disabled people reproducing. Plato's Republic and Aristotle's politics are utopian texts. They are imaginary creations. To what extent can we say that Aristotle and Plato's fellow Greeks were actually doing this? Some people think that the fact that Plato and Aristotle are compelled to include such an explicit statement suggests actually that people were probably not doing this. If this was a regular thing that people were already doing, they wouldn't need to be so explicit that it should be done in their utopian cities. So these are the three main texts that support the argument that ancient Greeks killed disabled infants. As I've tried to show, Plato's Republic and Aristotle's politics can't be used for evidence of actual fourth century BCE practice. And Plutarch is just too far removed to be relevant for reliable reconstruction of ancient Spartan practice without any corroboration from any other source. Now, classicists like myself are generally aware of the problems in understanding these texts as descriptive of ancient life. And we can talk about why they continue to be used as evidence for this one specific practice. Fortunately, though, we can not only discount this evidence as supporting the claim, but we actually have other evidence that actively supports the opposite argument that ancient Greeks didn't kill disabled infants. This other evidence that I'll show you is not utopian, and it's not 700 years later. It's contemporary with the ancient Greek societies of the classical and Hellenistic periods, and it reflects actual engagement with real disabled people. The one I'm going to talk about mainly comes from the Hippocratic Corpus. The Hippocratic Corpus is a collection of about 70 treatises that mostly date to the late 5th and 4th centuries BCE. These texts are all popularly attributed to one person, Hippocrates of Kos, whom you can see depicted in this mosaic. He's the one sitting down as he welcomes the healing goddess Sclepius to the island. Now, Hippocrates is a famous ancient physician, but the texts in the Hippocratic corpus probably were not written by Hippocrates himself. They were written over the course of several hundred years by a number of anonymous practicing physicians who maybe sub subscribed to a similar like school of medicine. And they were probably all collected together under the same umbrella of the Hippocratic corpus sometime in the Hellenistic period.
Now, no author of a Hippocratic treatise explicitly states whether parents should raise or kill a disabled infant, but we have hints about what they would say on the matter, statements that support the famous Hippocratic desire to help and not to harm, familiar today as first do no harm, claimed to be a part of the Hippocratic oath, though it actually comes from a different text. The specific treatise that I'll look at is called On Joints. It's a kind of practical manual for treating all sorts of injuries and dislocations of the joints. Now in one passage of On Joints, the physician talks about patients that he says are weasel armed from birth. Based on his descriptions, he seems to be talking about infants who are born with a limb difference that causes one arm to be shorter than the other or clubbed in some way. Now, the term weasel armed here seems to be purely descriptive to give people a visual of what he's talking about. As you can see from this image, weasels have short arms relative to the length of their bodies. The term does not seem to be derogatory in this context, though, of course, now we bristle at the comparison of human bodies to animals. Now, the physician says that this limb difference is congenital, meaning it would render someone disabled at birth. So this is presumably the kind of infant who under the standard paradigm would be a candidate for infanticide. If infants who appeared disabled at birth were killed, surely these infants would be included. This treatise, by the way, has just some amazing manuscript illustrations. So the slides are gonna show some of those, even if they're not strictly speaking related to the joint area I'm discussing. Okay, so let's see what this physician says about infants with this congenital limb difference. The physician says that those who are weasel armed from birth are of course able to use their affected arm. He says that people with this limb difference can't stretch their arm up by their ear if they extend their elbow, but he says that after they stop feeling pain in their arm, they can easily perform tasks that require them to swing their arm along their sides, forwards or backwards. He lists some of the tools that they can easily use, like two different kinds of saws. He says that they can swing an ax and they can dig and they can do any other tasks that require these same movements. He says that people with this limb difference can do physical therapy to develop their affected arm. He talks about craft production, and he says that people with this limb difference can perform craft production eagerly with their affected arm, and that, quote, the impaired arm is not at all inferior to the unimpaired one. Now, we can infer two things from this discussion. In the first place, the physician is not describing wealthy patients, people who could afford not to work for a living. He specifically mentions tools associated with physical labor and craft production, meaning that he's talking about people who might use these tools and might engage in craft production. Secondly, he does not see infants born with a limb difference as useless or worthless as a result of their congenital disability. He doesn't recommend infanticide, but he says that these infants grow up to live economically productive lives. This same physician eventually makes his way to describing the lower body, and he talks about infants born with club foot. Today, club foot is the most common congenital impairment, and we don't know its rate of occurrence in the ancient world, but it's not surprising that it was known and that a physician was aware of it. The physician says that most cases of congenital club foot are treatable, and he outlines a lengthy regimen of adjustments and rotations and bindings and bandagings for it. Once it's treated, he says that patients can wear special shoes to provide additional support, what he calls mud shoes, which have thick soles to support the heel. He also says that Cretan shoes work well for this purpose. Now, these two passages about infants with a congenital limb difference and infants with congenital club foot are important. In the first place, the physician is not despairing about the plight of these infants. He's just discussing matter-of-factly how to treat their impairments, what kinds of accommodations or aids they might need, and then he moves on. We might be able to explain this away, okay? We might say physicians knew better about the realities of impairments, and so maybe they didn't want to kill disabled infants, but we can't expect that parents or midwives without this kind of training would respond in the same way. Now we might say that, but 
in the ancient world, birth was not a medical event. It was not something that physicians typically attended. Physicians were not involved in decisions regarding childbirth. If this physician saw and treated disabled infants, it's because parents and midwives did not kill those infants and instead sought the physician's assistance and advice to help these infants survive and thrive. Now we have other texts that are similar. In another Hippocratic treatise, for example, we have descriptions of what is likely cleft palate, another congenital impairment. In fact, throughout the Hippocratic corpus, physicians describe congenital conditions like they do any other condition, like baldness and fevers. They're not necessarily problematic or hopeless. They're something for them to treat. And they are clear that congenital impairments are not predictive of anything. That is, congenital impairments don't tell you anything about the productive potential of infants born with them. The texts in the Hippocratic corpus range in purpose and practice, but many of them reflect practical experience of physicians who treated patients from throughout the Greek speaking world. These practical discussions of people who actually interacted with disabled people should outweigh the imaginary utopias, utopias of Plato and Aristotle. Now add to all of this, the examples that we have of people with congenital disabilities, like that Spartan King Agesilaus II, like Labda, who's the mother of the Corinthian tyrant Sipsilis, as well as people whose names we don't know, whose skeletons we've excavated or who are represented on Greek vases, like this man with dwarfism on this vase, all of these people with congenital disabilities who were not killed at birth and other evidence of people actively providing care and treatment for disabled infants in order to encourage their survival. So we have literary evidence, okay, that it was common. We have, we don't, sorry, we don't have any literary evidence that it was commonplace or legally prescribed to kill disabled infants. We don't have literary evidence that it was ever actually practiced. And actually we have evidence of parents, midwives and physicians helping disabled infants survive and thrive. Thankfully, we have other evidence that supports this idea that ancient Greeks sometimes made active and extraordinary efforts to assist disabled infants. I'm gonna turn now to material culture evidence, specifically these little cups known in English as feeding bottles. This one here, which I'll return to in a bit, shows their general form. These are short rounded cups with small mouths at the top a long narrow spout, and then a handle positioned about 90 degrees from the body, um, around the body from the spout. These bottles can be plain or decorated. They're usually made out of terracotta or fired clay. Now these bottles are primarily found in burials of infants under about age one, and they're found all over the Greek speaking world. In the fourth century BCE, we have examples from the Greek mainland, from Rhodes, from the Black Sea region, from Asia Minor, from Palestine, from Spain, and from Cyrenaica, which is sort of modern Libya. Now, while these bottles are associated with infants, they are not something that many infants had. First, as I said, most of them are found in burials. But while the cups are widespread geographically, they are not common. In Pydna, which is a site in northern Greece, archaeologists identified feeding bottles in less than 10% of infants' graves from the 4th century BCE. Breastfeeding was almost universal at this time, so if an infant was being fed out of one of these bottles, they were the exception. These bottles were not a typical or common alternative that a parent would choose. So these bottles are widespread but rare. They're found mostly in tombs, which suggests that they should be associated with infants with a relatively high risk of mortality. They're also professionally made, which means there was a reliable market for this type of cup. And while the cups are mostly found in tombs, they're not just grave goods. They were actually used before they were put into the tomb because some of them, like this one at the Ashmolean Museum at Oxford, have tooth marks on the spout, suggesting that it was used by a teething infant before it wound up in the tomb. 
We can also see a feeding bottle being used in this figurine group from the early 5th century BCE from a region in central Greece called Boeotia. A female figure, maybe the mother or a nurse, supports a male infant on her lap. In her right hand, she holds a feeding bottle up to the mouth of the infant. In her left hand, she has an object which is identified as a folded rag for wiping up any spilled liquid. Now there's some debate about what these bottles were for, whom they were made for, what liquids they held, and why they were put into tombs. Some argue that the bottles were used during weaning. That's when infants stop drinking breast milk and transition to solid foods. Other people argue that the bottles were definitely not used during weaning and instead were an alternative to breastfeeding. Some argue that the cups were purely symbolic, that they symbolized the infant's death and their inability to continue consuming food. Other people argue that the cups were actually breast pumps used to draw milk from a woman's breast, which would then be fed directly to the infant from the same vessel. People also debate the contents of these cups. Some people argue that they couldn't hold liquid because the spouts are too narrow, but chemical analyses show that many of these held human or animal milk. There is one Bronze Age example that showed that the bottles could also hold non-milk products like certain kinds of medical mixtures. We don't have literary evidence to help us identify what these cups are. The only potential literary reference comes from a Hippocratic treatise, so a medical text. The physician in this treatise describes a specialized drinking cup called a bombilios. He says that a bombilios has a narrow mouth, but he doesn't provide additional details. The reason I think this is a reference to a feeding bottle is not only how the physician describes it, but also because the word usually means bumblebee. And if you're thinking about the bottle shape, it might be kind of like a bumblebee with a rounded body, a handle like a wing, and a long narrow spout like a stinger. And if it's for children, it's pretty cute to call it a bumblebee. Of course, this is speculative, but it's a pretty tempting connection to make. I should also mention some of them are specifically shaped like breasts, so it's not total speculation that these were made for the nourishment of infants who might otherwise be expected to be breastfeeding. But what can we say about who used these cups and why? Here are our criteria for making our judgment. The cups held primarily milk, but also potentially non-milk medicinal liquids. They're very rare, relatively speaking, so they were produced for a specific and uncommon purpose. They're found with both newborns and young children, so they're not intended to be used exclusively as either an alternative for breastfeeding or as an aid for weaning. These bottles are sometimes but rarely found with adults, so whatever they were used for, sometimes adults needed them too, but what kind of adults? Well, a recent excavation at a late Bronze Age cemetery revealed a feeding bottle with the cemetery's oldest adult who had significant age-related impairments, including a lot of tooth loss that would have made it very difficult to chew solid foods. So someone who might be expected to eat solid foods, but who needed assistance eating because of tooth loss. Finally, the bottles primarily come from tombs, but they were used before they were deposited. And these aren't just symbolic. The evidence for these bottles suggests that the individuals who used them were at an unusually high risk of death. The likeliest users then were infants and small children, sometimes adults who were ill or impaired in such a way that either sucking milk out of a breast in the case of infants or drinking out of a wide mouth cup for older children and adults was not possible. These bottles then represent a form of active accommodation for infants and small children who needed assistance due to illness or disability. This is a demonstration not only that individual parents or nurses helped their children, but also that this was a cultural need. Enough parents wanted to help their children that the cups were produced by professional potters and painters. So far then, we have zero evidence for ancient Greeks killing disabled infants. 
We have Hippocratic authors talking about the productive potential of infants born with congenital disabilities. We have a whole class of feeding bottles that were specifically produced and used to accommodate infants who required levels of care that exceeded that of their peers, children who required additional support in, that, in order to survive, a category that surely included infants that we might refer to as disabled. Now, whether or not these cups actually did help these kids survive is irrelevant because parents tried to keep them alive. The last piece of evidence I want to introduce comes from a second century BCE well from downtown Athens. This deposit was recently published in full by Mariah Liston, Susan Rotroff, and Lynn Snyder in a book that is a fantastic example of the kind of excellent work that happens when specialists collaborate and talk to each other instead of each one publishing their class of materials separately. Uh, this well is known as the Agara Bone Well. It was a well that originally served as a water source, but then after it was no longer productive for water, it was used as a kind of trash pit for bronze workers, and then was used as the final resting place for at least 459 infants. When the well was originally excavated, the bones were collected together alongside the bones of at least 150 dogs, which makes it impossible to study the skeletons whole. Instead, uh, different skeletal elements have to be studied individually in isolation from the whole body. This makes interpretation difficult, but there's still plenty of information. So the well is located in the Agara, which is a very public place, but it was tucked away and easy to access privately. Before this most recent publication, there were a lot of different interpretations for what caused this deposit of so many infants, including symbolic sacrifice, famine, or plague. Infanticide was considered as a potential explanation because most of the infants died within about a week after birth. As the recent archaeologist who published about the well showed, there's abundant evidence of natural mortality among the infants. These ar archaeologists were able to identify evidence for a variety of diseases and conditions, including premature, and, premature birth and low birth weight, infection and hemorrhage, developmental defects and cleft palates on a relatively high proportion of the skeletons. These signs were on enough of the skeletons that they concluded that most, if not all, of the infants died of natural causes. It's not surprising to us that we see these infants buried in a well instead of a formal cemetery. Earlier, I talked about that amphidromia, that ceremony that initiated infants into a family. If a child died before this ceremony, they hadn't been socially born yet, um, and so they were unlikely to be given a formal burial, so they would be buried more informally, like in a well. Of course, as the authors note, we cannot rule out infanticide as a cause of death for some of these infants. If we admit that infanticide was practiced, even if it was rare, we cannot say definitively that no infant in this deposit was intentionally killed. One older child in the deposit does seem to have been the victim of child abuse, so it's not like we're talking about a utopian time when all children were always and equally loved. But what's going on here? Most of the infants died of natural causes, though we can't say that none of them were killed intentionally. And we definitely cannot say which infants would have been killed intentionally, if any, based on the remains. Now, important here is that some of the infants were born with congenital impairments. What can we say about those infants? Were they likely to have been intentionally killed? Let's look at one. Um, in the next slide, I'm going to show a picture of arm bones of one infant. If you want to minimize the video, I'll tell you when I'm finished showing it. Here we have the ulna and the humerus of one of the infants in the Agara well. Both segments of the infant's arm were as short as those belonging to a much smaller fetus, but they were as thick as the bones of a nearly full-term infant. As noted in the publication, the dimensions of these bones, quote, suggest a severe growth anomaly resulting in stunted limbs. This infant can be compared with the infant described by the Hippocratic physician as being weasel armed from birth, right, with one arm that is shorter or less developed compared to the other. 
But as we learned from that physician, individuals with this limb difference may have limited mobility in one arm and they may be unable to raise their arm straight out, but they can perform a wide variety of tasks just as easily as anyone with two unimpaired arms. And for that reason, we shouldn't su suspect that this infant was automatically or immediately killed. So this infant is instead as likely to have died of natural causes as any other infant in the deposit. We cannot assume that it was likelier to have been a victim of infanticide because of its congenital disability, especially when we have an ancient physician speaking directly to this condition and saying that it's not a problem. Okay, I've switched away from the picture of bones if you want to return to the presentation. So in addition to other kinds of debris and skeletons and dog skeletons in this well, there were also a small number of grave goods, things that the living would deposit into tombs with the dead as tokens or gifts of memory. One of the objects placed in the well to accompany the body of one of the deceased infants was this feeding bottle. Now we can't say which infant this bottle was deposited with, but given that these bottles provided active assistance to infants who were sick or ill or disabled, it was probably used to feed one of these infants, maybe even one of the seven infants who had cleft palates. The mere presence of this bottle suggests that the parents of at least one of these infants in the deposit took extra efforts in order to help them survive. I'm about to show another picture of some skeletal remains from the deposit, um, if you'd like to minimize the video. In addition to the feeding bottle, we have evidence for someone providing active assistance to at least one other infant who is deposited in the well. In this case, the infant is a little older, maybe six to eight months. Unless you're a bone specialist, you may not know what we're looking at here, but this infant had hydrocephalus before it died. Hydrocephalus is a symptom that's associated with a number of different diseases and conditions. It can be either congenital or acquired. Regardless, hydrocephalus is a gradual and a progressive thing. It's, just, it's not just a matter of presence or absence, but a condition that gets progressively worse unless it's addressed or the infant dies. As the publishers of this well said, quote, the child was cared for during a period when it would have become progressively more debilitated and more disturbing in appearance, end quote. In this case, an infant with a kind of liminal status, liminal because it's buried in a well and not in a formal cemetery, received extraordinary care for an extended period of time, long enough for significant changes to the cranium to develop. This infant was not killed at the first sign of disability or impairment, but probably died naturally from its disease. This infant and the feeding bottles show that at least some ancient Greek parents or nurses expended great care for infants whose needs exceeded those of others. I've moved away now from the slide showing human remains if you'd like to rejoin the presentation. Okay, so what do we have all together? First, I think we can effectively dismiss the argument that ancient Greeks killed disabled infants at birth. We have no evidence for it, and if someone wants to argue it, they're going to have to present something tangible for us to think about. On the other side of the coin, to my argument that the Greeks did not kill disabled infants, we have Hippocratic physicians who actively worked with disabled infants. We have examples of ancient Greek adults with congenital disabilities, so obviously they were not killed at birth. We have feeding bottles, which show active assistance to help infants with their survival. And we have a disabled infant from the Agara bone well who was actively cared for when it became progressively more disabled until it eventually died and was buried in the well. Now, when we talk about disability and infanticide in the ancient world, we have responsibilities. First, we have to define what we mean by disability. There are a lot of different kinds of disabilities. You can't just say disabled infants without being clear what kinds of impairments or conditions you intend to include in your statement. As Alice Wong says in the introduction of this recent collection of essays, disability is not a monolith, nor is it a clear-cut binary of disabled and non-disabled. Disability is mutable and ever-evolving. Disability is both apparent and non-apparent. Disability is pain, struggle, brilliance, abundance, and joy. Disability is socio-political, cultural, and biological. 
Arguments about disability and infanticide in the ancient world often beg the question, that is they assume already a threshold of disability of what is disabled enough to mark an individual out to be killed at birth. But these evaluations are made implicitly by the researcher, not explicitly by the evidence. I hope I've shown that modern evaluations of disability don't really match ancient realities. My argument here is not that disabled infants were never killed at birth. We can assume that some infants, regardless of gender, regardless of disability or social status or any other aspect of their identity were killed for a variety of complex reasons. Even today, some parents kill their children, but we don't say that it's our cultural practice. I'm arguing based on the evidence that ancient Greek parents wanted their kids to live and helped them in any way that they could. And I'll leave you with this cute figurine of a woman cradling a baby in her arms. Thank you so much. Thank you, Debbie, for a wonderful talk. Um, we have questions that are pouring in. Um, so I'm going to try to get through an, as many as I can um, before we have to take our break at 11. Um, so I'm going to start with a question from uh, Daniel Everton. So he says, thank you for your talk. I'm curious about deafness and blindness in the ancient world. And I was curious if there were any primary sources that you've come across that discuss either of those. Yeah, for sure. Deafness and blindness get discussed a lot in literature in the ancient world. Um, you know, immediate figures who come to mind, we have a mythological figure, a famous mythological figure named Tiresias, who is sort of probably the most famous blind person in the ancient world. Um, but we do have literary references. We also have some archaeological evidence. Um, so at healing cults in the ancient world, people would dedicate uh, it, representations of body parts that they wanted healed by the God. And we have a lot of eyes and ears. And that doesn't necessarily mean blindness and deafness, but surely some of them do. Um, and we also have inscriptions that refer, for example, at a healing sanctuary of Asclepius at Epidaurus, a man brings his son who um, has mutism. He's nonverbal, okay, when he comes to the sanctuary and the father is sort of praying to the God for his son to speak. Um, we have a lot of evidence. Um, Croesus, the Lydian king in Herodotus, has a deaf son. Okay, so we have a lot of evidence for this. And I see another, um, another question up here about ASL for the deaf in ancient Greece. Not exactly, um, but we do have a reference in uh, either Aristotle or Plato of people using gestures. So probably, um, so deaf people using gestures to communicate. So probably not a formal uh, sign language exactly, but we have evidence of people communicating um, non-verbally in the ancient world. Um, if you're interested in sources for deafness or blindness, I recommend that you check out Martha Rose's book, The Staff of Oedipus. I think she addresses these two things specifically. Great, thank you. I'll move on to our next one um, from Atticus Card. During cases of infanticide, were the, um, were the disability ones that are connected to mythological creatures, such as the Celtic channeling in which the family thought the child was not theirs? Um, I can't speak to non-Greek um, systems for infanticide. Uh, what I can say is that it's going to be different um, in different cultures. And um, even if the result is the same, it'll be for very specific cultural reasons. Um, so I can't speak to uh, Celtic tradition, um, but I mean, it's a great question. And I'm sure that there are people working on this who are doing um, great work with disability studies on this. Great. Okay, next one. Um, to what extent do you think the classical scholars of the 19th and 20th century might have, might have subscribed to the infanticide texts of Plutarch, Plato, and Aristotle because of a belief in eugenics? Um, I think a lot of people uh, in the 19th and 20th century who uh, believed in eugenics or subscribed to this theory of eugenics, I think a lot of them uh, used, uh, used ancient Greek evidence to support uh, their case. Um, so obviously the most egregious example of this is the Nazis, and you can read about um, Hitler's engagement with ancient Spartan practice of killing disabled infants in his texts. 
Okay, and as sort of a maybe then a follow up to the last statement you just made, um, were there not differences in the cultures of different city states in terms of um, infanticide? Definitely, uh, we can assume that there were differences between them. Although I will say that uh, certain cultural practices tended to uh, cross those borders. And I would think that something like infanticide would, that that would be more of a Greek cultural practice than a uh, practice of an individual city state. Um, and unfortunately, um, our data at present is just not good enough to get better resolution than this. Great. Okay, I have a really interesting question about feeding bottles here. Um, so why could the feeding bottles not be for infants whose mothers were unable to breastfeed and for whom there was no available wet nurse? It's a great question. Um, in theory, they could be, um, although uh, I think we can assume that the vast majority of children were breastfed, that um, either they were breastfed by their mother, but we also have a lot of evidence for wet nurses, even in relatively small communities. We have um, not just references to them sort of second and third hand in text, but also um, in letters that are written, uh, preserved on papyri of people talking about hiring wet nurses um, from even sort of remote places. So. Um, I, I don't think that we could say that that's a, a, typical, a typical experience in the ancient world. Great. Okay, next question um, from Jane Peterson. Has there been any DNA analysis or perhaps material culture clues about patterns of sex among the human remains in the Agora bone well? Um, uh, somewhat. So the, I would point you to this, uh, this book on the Agora bone well that was published by the American School of Classical Studies at Athens for a thorough discussion of uh, the bones. Um, unfortunately, it's very difficult to sex infant skeletons and uh, DNA does not survive very well in general, but especially um, from bones of this type. Um, and so I can't say that that is uh, particularly um, instructive for us. People have tried to do this. There's another large collection of infant skeletons from Ashkelon in Israel. Um, and DNA, and this is a good example of the problems with this, DNA analysis showed that most of the bones that were sampled were male infants. And so people had a bunch of interpretations of the collections based on that. Um, but like a very, like a minuscule proportion of the skeletons were actually able to be sampled. And so it's not very representative. Thank you. Okay, we have a question from uh, Letitia. Uh, so the presence of the hydrocephalic skull of the six to eight month old is the evidence for the care that she or he received, or was there, the, or was there other physical evidence found on the cranium for that child? So the fact that the infant lived as long as it did with hydrocephaly is the evidence that it was provided with care. Without active care, the infant would have died at a much sooner point in the progression of the illness um, or the condition that it had that gave it hydrocephalus. Um, so it had to have been cared for, like fed and otherwise cared for, for long enough for the skeleton to have developed in this way. Perfect. I'm just scrolling for questions and trying not to find <laughs> repetitive ones here. Um, okay, so let's do this one from uh, Sarah Beckman. So hi, Debbie, thank you for this. I was hoping to hear more about the possible feeding bottles. My apologies uh, if I missed this. Um, she was with listening with her four month old, which is lovely. Um, but might these bottles be connected to everything from cleft palate to issues with the latch? Problems with latching might be thought of as very basic, but it supports the arguments for a disability is non-binary. Definitely. So um, these bottles could have been used for a number of different reasons. I don't know the statistics of the number of children who have difficulty latching and whether or not that number can be expected to be consistent across time and place or if there are sort of uh, cultural reasons for it. Um, so I, I can't speak to that specifically. Um, but yes, that is another potential reason for um, for these feeding bottles. Um, however, what I would say is that the fact that the bottles are found in tombs suggests that the infants who use them are at a high risk of death, which wouldn't necessarily apply to infants who have trouble latching, unless the latch 
issue is related to something else. Okay, and then as a sort of follow-up question, also from Sarah, um, she's also wondering if you can talk a little bit about the physics of the feeding bottles. Um, if infants need to suckle to get the milk, at least for the first couple of months, how would the bottle work? Is it more about just depositing liquid in baby's mouth? Yes, it's just about depositing the liquid in the baby's mouth. So these bottles actually do fulfill the requirements of modern bottles that are used to feed infants with conditions like cleft palates. So um, the, those kinds of bottles, they need to dispense liquid slowly and without requiring the infant to suck. And these bottles would fulfill those requirements. Um, and so um, in it, this fits with our understanding of what would be necessary for an infant who has difficulty sucking. Okay. Um, question from Joseph. While you speak to the social perspectives of disabilities in ancient antiquity, are there any sources directly deriving from um, denoted disabled peoples regarding self perception? Yeah, this is, um, this is something that I'm only recently coming to appreciate myself is sources that we have of disabled people directly speaking about disability. There are some that are sort of speculative. So the one that probably most people would point you to is a, a speech written by a non-disabled person uh, by a man named Lysias. It's called Lysias 24. Uh, so he, as far as we know, was non-disabled, but the speech was written to be delivered by a disabled man, and he's directly talking about his disability. So he's been accused of receiving a disability pension fraudulently in the fourth century BCE, and it's his defense. He's describing his disability. He's describing his financial situation. He's describing what aids or accommodations he requires for his disability. But that one was written by maybe a non-disabled person one that I really like is uh, the Roman author Seneca. So he um, had something like asthma and one of his letters, he's actually writing about his asthma, what an asthma, what an attack feels like. He writes in the letter that doctors describe his attacks as practicing how to die, right? So we have these like really fantastic um, descriptions from Seneca of his disability as he experiences it. We also in the Roman period have a man named Aelius Aristides, and he wrote a lot about his chronic illness. He spent years trying to find a treatment or a cure for his chronic illness, and he chronicled his entire journey um, in a text. Well, that's fantastic, thanks. Okay, I'm gonna to try to get through maybe two more before we have to wrap up. Um, so the next one I'll ask you here is, is there any evidence from the Brow Round Sanctuary to Artemis concerning births of disabled, in, disabled infants or the treatment of the mother in these cases? Um, I'll just say, I don't know. Um, I think that's the, the quickest answer here. I don't know specifically about the Sanctuary of Artemis and Brow Round. Okay, and then last one. Um, we've talked a lot about physical disability within Greek culture and how they are actively trying to save and nurture their children. But do we have any literary or physical evidence about mental disability? Yes, we have a lot of evidence about mental illness. A lot of people working on this topic of mental illness, um, intellectual disabilities, um, and things like that in the ancient world. It's not specifically what I work on, but um, most of this evidence is going to be literary. Um, so right mental illness is not necessarily going to show up in the archaeological record although that's not entirely true we have a skeleton from the early iron age for example of a man who experienced a fall at some point and severely damaged his skull and um, it's sort of enough that it probably caused uh, certain kinds of um, mental illness uh, for him or i don't know the exact word i would use but uh, most of this is going to be literary, and there are, I think there's an edited collection on mental illness in the ancient world, um, and uh, you can also find it discussed in sort of general books about disability in the ancient world. Wonderful. Well, we've reached 11 o'clock, which is the end of our allotted time, um, so I...
there's still, I would say about 30 questions left for you, um, Debbie, but unfortunately we can't get to them all today. Um, well, but I would if like- If anyone has any burning questions, you can feel free to email me. I'm gonna put my email in the chat. You can also find me on Twitter and I'm happy to answer any of your inquiries. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for this fascinating talk, uh, Debbie, and for this very sort of fruitful discussion that followed and all the questions that you were able to get through. Um, for now, we're going to take a 30 minute break, uh, after which AIA Society officers are invited uh, to log into the annual society uh, breakfast or brunch, which is going to start at 1130 PST. Uh, this will be through a different Zoom link, uh, which you, I think Meredith just sent everyone again in their emails. Um, and we want to take this opportunity to, of course, thank all of our society officers um, in the brunch uh, for all the hard work you've put in over the last year. Um, and again, thank you, Debbie, for this really engaging, thoughtful presentation. Um, and I can't wait personally to hear more about all the work that you're coming up with um, in, the next, in the next little while. So thank you again, and society officers, we'll see you at 1130 for the society brunch. Thanks, everyone.